Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar hosted by the Lao China Institute uh, for the ESRC Festival of Social Sciences. Today's session is on art, uh, diplomacy, and climate cooperation. My name is Hannah Bretherton, and I am the Impact and Engagement Manager at, at the Lao China Institute. And we are delighted today to have three very different perspectives on this topic. Uh, today, we'll start off with a visual virtual art presentation by artist and scholar Lola Frost, who is a visiting research fellow in the War Studies Department at King's College London. We will then hear from researcher, artist and curator Angela Chan, who will also share some of her artwork and perspectives on this topic. Before we then welcome our Lao Chair of Chinese International Relations, uh, Professor Astrid Norden, who will give her uh, views on um, how Taoist principles and yin yang concepts relate to diplomacy and climate cooperation. We'll then bring everybody together for a panel discussion and there will be an opportunity for audience Q&A. So make sure you have your questions ready. We wanna make sure this is a, a very uh, conversational and open and inclusive discussion. So uh, make sure you contribute your thoughts at the end. Um, without further ado, I would like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Lola Frost. Um, and she will be giving us a presentation uh, as well as we will have her artwork rolling through as well um, in a sort of virtual art exhibition format. So welcome, Lola. Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, the pluralities of both art and ethics resist description. And in the very short time that I have, I'll do my best to clarify something of my understanding of that complexity. My approach to ethics proceeds from the assumption that our ethical values are argued for or performed through intersecting matrices of mutual recognition. In the context of the challenges posed by climate change, this presentation explores the life force ethics of three art practices, mine, Yafeng Duan's, and Simon Sefton's, and how these are implicated in that relational matrix. But first, some preliminary observations. It's worth noting that our aesthetic experience of art is realized through processes of encounter that ex exceed description. Furthermore, insofar as a art is a locus, like art activism, through which we interrogate, build, and actualize our ethical commitments to one another and our planet, its unique contribution to these efforts is via its sense-based methods that resist purpose of application. Secondly, in developing this presentation, I was intrigued by the convergent and tensions between the ethical life force commitments of my painting practice and those of Taoism, which Astrid Norden touches on in her presentation later. Both are constituted by a pluralizing relationality, although with differing political destinations. Taoism is an ancient and quietist Chinese philosophy whose yin-yang dynamics constitute order, whereas the life ethics that inform my painting practice subvert the power dynamics of political order. My point being that the life force ethics under consideration here is itself ethically stratified. So starting with my claim that our ethical values are argued for or performed through intersecting matrices of mutual recognition, I understand that the life force ethics of my painting practice is constitutive of a liberal plot politics of resistance that, broadly stated, contests those systems of domination that both naturalize inequality and reward hubristic practices that plunder our planet. Such resistance, I suggest, is realized in the disaggregating pulsal fractal energies of these paintings, the challenging the mastering and territorializing optics of Western painting, and which are inclined towards vulnerability and objection. These paintings also scramble the distinctions between body and landscape to interrogate the boundary between a pulsing, improper, libidinal, and excessive sense of embodiment and the regulations of the phallocentric order. Described in this way, I suggest, suggest that this painting practice stages an ethical critique 
that exceeds misogynistic systems of domination and which together with racism, heteronormativity and identity politics, for example, is caught up in our ethical struggles to mutually recognize one another as free and equal or not. This ethical critique extends to those systems of domination that sanction territorial control and state sovereignty, practices of mastery that have gone hand in hand with the economic growth interests of the fossil fuel industries. The question is, what is the value of such a sense-based life force ethics as we face the approaching storm of climate change? I have no doubt that the economic, political, cultural, and technological changes that need to be made soon should and hopefully will be met through centralized and rational solutions that involve individuals, states, and civil society actors. But rising to the challenges of climate change will also involve us addressing those ethical assumptions that shape our personal and international relations. My answer then is that art practices, even those that are radically subversive, have something of an intermediary or perhaps diplomatic role to play in that complex political matrix, which we better need better to develop as we enter fractious negotiations around climate change. More especially perhaps as art operates beneath and alongside regulatory narratives, discourses and practices that sustain our current order. And in so doing has the potential to enter our shared cultural and psychic DNA in creative, productive and irrational ways. It is with such sense-based diplomacy in mind that I briefly approach the life force ethic, ethics of Berlin-based Chinese artist Yafeng Duan, whose abstract and figurative paintings will be on view here soon. As you might have noticed, as you or sorry, as you will notice, Duan's watercolor paintings dance with a life force energy or ki that is ecstatically realized in the act of painting via the touch and twists of line and in the ravishing accumulations of water color that pulse with a life force to bring each player's, each viewer's creative dower into play. I think I, I timed these a little bit slowly, but we'll get to my next point in a minute, but this gives you a chance to have a look at these wonderful paintings. And the spatially compressed fractal accumulations of Duan's other, but constitutive style of painting effectively wrestles towards something like an underbelly, perhaps a sublime inform of that lyrical beauty. This interface, interface, sorry, this interface invites comparison with the Taoist principles of yin and yang as the interplay of opposites sustaining a harmonious whole, even as that lyricism and underbelly, I sense, threaten to collapse into one another. What could be said about this pluralizing interface, but in the context of this discussion, that precarious doubling, I suggest positions this practice across the aesthetic values of two cultures, namely between the Taoist life force commitments of traditional Chinese painting and those of the Western aesthetics of the sublime at a time when geopolitical tensions and collaboration between China, Europe and America are intensifying. Duan's Relational and pluralizing practice invites its viewers to imagine and sense something of what is ethically at stake in that cultural gap. Lastly, a brief consideration of Simon Sefton's photography. These exquisite images of reflections in moving water and its intertwinement with trees, rocks and sky team with their own life force. This fractal image practice also hovers between abstraction and figuration to deliver an energy that courses between our human experience and the life force of water. Perhaps not unlike Merleau-Ponty's claim that our intersubjective relations with one another and with the material world, as well as our encounters with art objects, are always reciprocal and intertwined. Seen in this way, our aesthetic experience of these photographs implicates us in the non-human life world of the material world. 
Yet our relation to the life-giving force of water is itself at risk from climate change. Sefton lives in Cape Town, which as some of you might recall in 2017 and 18, approached day zero with the threat that all the water storage dams in the Western Cape would be empty because of low, record low rainfall and because the South African government failed adequately to invest in water provision facilities and upgrades for a massively expanding city. That catastrophic day was fortunately averted. My point being that Sefton's images do not directly address the very real climate governance induced water crisis, nor indeed its practical resolution. As images imbued with the life force of water, this photography practice mobilizes an ethics of encounter that is not caught up in the presumption that water is reducible to its usefulness to humans. Instead, these photographs invite the viewers to imaginatively invest in a life force energy that includes, but also exceeds our human centric worldview. In so doing, this sense-based practice draws its viewers into a complex matrix of mutual recognition through which they might recognize a life world that is not human, but which humans are totally dependent on. To wrap up, in addressing the topic of ethics, art, and climate change in this way, I have made the case that our ethical values, including those mobilized by scientists, industrialists, and politicians, and by artists, are argued for or performed through intersecting matrices of mutual recognition. As a case, as, sorry, as a case study of the relation between art and ethics, I have sketched how a pluralizing and relational life force ethics that inhabits my, Duan's, and Sefton's art practices variously critiques repressive systems of domination, bridges cultural and aesthetic divides between the West and China, and engages with the non-human life force of the material world. These three art practices are a drop in the ocean of the many art practices, and indeed also of the political, academic, scientific, legal, industrial, technological, and art activist initiatives, all of which are implicated in developing a flexible and critical, correlational and internationalizing ethical matrix, matrix as we collectively face the challenge of climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lola. That was absolutely fascinating. And there was some beautiful artwork and imagery there that was a really nice backdrop to what you were saying. So um, really looking forward to getting into the discussion with you about that. I'd now like to welcome Angela Chan, who is a climate change communicator. And um, we're very interested to see some of your artwork and hear your thoughts. So welcome, Angela. Thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me to share some of my work and um, ideas as well. Um, so thanks Astrid and also Hannah for organizing this. And so great to hear um, from Lola as well. I think there's a lot of things that resonates um, with my work and also the artworks that you've talked about. Water seems to be something that is going to be a connective flow between our presentations. Um, so I guess I'll start by introducing a little bit more about what I do. Um, I originally began my practice as a curator specialising on climate change themes and I gradually um, started to do quite a lot of research. Currently I am um, uh, oh, sorry. Currently, I am a research consultant in international climates and cultural policy um, and I also research through my arts practice and I'll kind of share some of the things that I've been doing in the, in the past year or so. And so when we're thinking about art and climate change and um, how we go about untangling a lot of the very global overlapping crises, um, it can be very intimidating. I uh, sometimes work with youth groups and we unpack these enormous ideas into something that's a lot more um, bite-sized and digestible. And um, there are two kind of foundational uh, strategies that I use to try and communicate climate change through creative practices. And so firstly, I use a lot of research and history and kind of recognize that a lot of our histories are unwritten or erased or are not um, deemed desirable enough to be resourced um, into writing down into our history textbooks. And I'm talking specifically about the marginalized histories um, of minoritized demographics um, and that the hegemonic narrative, 
one of the global north is the one that dominates a lot of the climate discourse even today from our cultural uh, kind of outlooks on it uh, through to the political discourses um, that we see uh, you know in the past couple of weeks at COP as well. And um, secondly, I think that it's really important to pay attention to the way that we talk about uh, these narratives, how we actually build up these stories. So one thing that I've been working quite a lot on in my own arts practice is kind of paying attention to um, how stories are framed and who actually has the agency to tell those stories, who has the agency, the power, um, to let those stories go down in history, to be archived for future generations to look back on. And so I think I'll just like share my screen now so that you can have a little look into some of the um, projects that I've been working on and have some kind of visuals to um, just to lay your eyes on while I speak about them. And um, I guess, you know, following on from what Lola has picked up on um, very well, water is, is, is kind of considered um, a, a growing, growingly scarce resource. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about how water is something that historically has brought people like me, racialized people into the UK through migration. And the way that we think about water also includes um, the you know, colonial uh, trade routes um, that have allowed things such as dynamites, which is in this project, um, to excavate different lands across the world um, and kind of uh, carry on this cycle of exploitation of not only the planets, but also the people. And when we're thinking about climate change, we have to um, put this in the same conversation as colonialism. And this is something that um, runs throughout my practice and um, with Exports Explode, which you see here. Um, it's a video piece that's about 15 minutes long, uh, com commissioned by Metal Culture for the Estuary 2021 Festival um, just earlier in this summer. And um, so I selected the Watt Tyler Country Park as the kind of sites of interest. And although the education team does a fantastic job of uh, talking about the local history, I was quite interested and concerned that there wasn't so much being talked about in terms of the global history um, and also the one in relation to climate change today. And so what Tyler Country Park is also the site of the Pitsy Explosives Factory. Um, which produced dynamite um, uh, on this Thames estuary site and exported it to uh, the British Empire's colonies um, and all the colonies' um, allies as well. And it, this was a kind of startup uh, created by the British government um, and Alfred Nobel of the Nobel Prizes. And it became this uh, one of the first, um, you know, modern multinationals as, as we know today. And what I was quite interested in was that we can go to a nature reserve during the pandemic and have this space of tranquility and, you know, uh, un have this access to something somewhere really green and wooded, but also not quite understanding that the military history or the kind of colonial production of arms is something that isn't neutral, it isn't tranquil. And while this site has existed, its history is actually unfinished. So in the video I talk about um, what kinds of materials were extracted by the dynamites, by the explosives that were sent from this specific site. Um, and I also um, try to kind of talk about the, the borders that are at play in the contemporary, bring this, um, this whole kind of uh, factory site into the contemporary times to talk about actually um, with it being an unfinished history, a lot of these lands have never recovered from these excavations and, and explosions. And in fact, this uh, factory site and the British um, Explosive Syndicate itself had kind of really set in stone the ideological, commercial, and also technological frameworks um, for the arms trade as we know it today. So when I was making this, um, or in, in the research period of me thinking about this, um, the news that Boris Johnson, our government, had um, 
poured in a, a huge amount of money into the defense sector. And it's the biggest since uh, the Cold War, the largest in 30 years. And this news actually came only a couple of weeks after a several months long campaign to feed children in poverty who were dependent on free school meals throughout the pandemic. And um, the government finally gave in to the campaign, um, uh, whereas before they were saying that there were no resources to do so. So at this very moment in time, what does it mean to say that we're in peacetime when citizens here and citizens elsewhere in the world are still feeling the effects of the British Empire's um, decision to not only you know, uh, not look after or conserve resources, but actively extract and continue the damage. And so um, this piece was kind of uh, exhibited on site, largely to people who are going to uh, watch the birds, because it's a RSPB bird watching um, visitor center, as well as a, a, a general wooded nature reserve. And it, I hope it kind of works as an informative video rather than such an art piece, um, so to say. Um, and to kind of continue with this water theme, I'm just gonna briefly um, talk about um, Rain Paradox, which was on show at Fact Liverpool um, and result, is a result of um, my kind of digital fellowship with them for the past year, um, also with Jerwood Arts. And um, Rain Paradox takes its title from the Great British Rain Paradox, which is a report that actually came out um, in June 2020. And it states that there's a paradox that 77% uh, of the uh, 2000 people surveyed uh, by, by RB Finish, which is a dishwasher tablet company that put out this report, say that, oh, well, the UK rains a lot and it's always wet and rainy, so therefore we, there, there shouldn't be a water scarcity issue in 20 years time, which is what the scientists um, project. And so it, it makes a very um, unconvincing argument that um, the consumer or, uh, you know, what we should actually say is the citizen who has rights to water shouldn't really be blamed for the scarcity um, of water that's to come. And um, throughout the reports, it talks a lot about ways to conserve water. There's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but it makes no attempt um, to be transparent about the government and uh, uh, corporate responsibility uh, to regulate water, which it hasn't done for decades. And so there's been a lot of news recently about um, a lot of sewage that has been going into our water systems um, and which is great that it's been picking up um, momentum in, in the country as well over these uh, past, past months or weeks. And so I was quite concerned that this report published in 2020 sits on the government's website as the overarching like sole narrative and what I was concerned to do as a climate, uh, creative climate communicator, someone who um, wants to document the, this moment in time uh, fairly and transparently, was to also archive or self-archive narratives by marginalized communities across regions in the UK to kind of understand what water practices mean to us. Um, and a lot of people actually talked um, in more ancestral terms of like healing properties in water, but also how water has brought us here through migration. Um, and there are also um, participants who are talking about how um, water has shaped certain cities. Um, Lalu and Yasmin here talk about um, abolition and the slave trade a lot in their portion of, the, uh, of, of my video piece. And it just gives a really fascinating view of how um, the bay of, the, of, of Cardiff city um, acted as a, as a kind of destination of migration for a lot of people. And that Butte's town itself, which is a very quite, like, quite racially and socioeconomically um, segregated area of Cardiff is actually so below uh, sea level that it would be the first to go when the um, sea level rises. And so I think, you know, to, to think about timelining of stories um, as something that is a, a very necessary task of our time um, is something that I want to kind of share with everyone here and really encourage that it's um, a tactic or a strategy that actually brings us further into the future into a more responsible 
uh, kind of action when we're facing not only a, a global climate change crisis, but also one of racial injustice, one that is, um, you know, seeing a, an increasing disparity between the poor and um, the rich and see that actually these crises are overlapping with health as well. Um, so a lot to think about, and I look forward to discussing more in a moment. Thank you so much, Angela. Wow, you've yeah really raised some important issues um, and you know very complex issues. So uh, I'm really looking forward to us digging more into that. I am now very pleased to welcome Professor Astrid Norden uh, to present on Taoism and Yin Yang and how that fits into this conversation. Wonderful, thank you. First of all, so much to my brilliant co-panelists for sharing the inspiring ideas and lived experience of their research as art. I'm going to be really brief today and contextualize my colleagues' contributions in terms of COP26 that's just concluded in Glasgow. And I'll use this brief time to stake down a gambit in advance of our conversation that climate negotiations are held hostage by the state-based imaginary of the world that is the basis for all COP negotiations. And I'll suggest that the artistic practice of art as research and as diplomacy that's been illustrated by my colleagues can provide the materials for bridging our divided approaches to climate change through uh, the kind of pluralist relationality that Lola has uh, explicitly uh, addressed and that I think uh, Angela's practice has also illustrated and both of their art embodies. So we're convening this panel in the wake of COP26 concluding in Glasgow. And as many of you will know, uh, there was an agreement, uh, but one which will most likely fail to prevent the planetary temperature to reach disastrous levels. Much of the time at COP26 was wasted on a hostile blame game by its most powerful participants, which, for example, pitted China against the UK and the West more broadly. So... Chinese representatives rightly criticized rich states for failing to deliver on previous commitments, especially to climate finance and the final agreement reached in Glasgow also failed to pin down the finance commitments that would be necessary between states because of concerns about constituencies within what are largely thought of as Western states. Now, the same Chinese representatives repeated uh, and retreated into a rhetoric that stipulates that each country should be able to do what it wants, essentially. And China was blamed, together with India, for the watered down final agreement, simply committing to a phasing down of coal investment rather than phasing it out because of Chinese commitments to its own GDP growth that relies on coal power. So at the end of the day, imagined and shorter term national interests prevailed over planetary interests in averting climate change uh, catastrophe. Now, the idea of unit based interest is, I think, profoundly bound up in the colonial practices and violence that Angela Chan's research as art explores. The dominant political imaginaries of the world and relations in it are not working well enough. As global temperatures and water levels rise, so do the voices demanding a serious rethinking of our approaches to planetary politics. The dominant frameworks and vocabularies and imagery that form the basis for these climate negotiations are not good enough. I think the previous presentations have illustrated that art as a diplomatic practice in people-to-people -people relations can help uh, rethink our political imaginaries. And I think that they suggest that we uh, need to move beyond the kind of jigsaw puzzle view of the planet as consisting of mutually exclusive spatial units and find images that enable us to conceptualize humans and nature as mutually constitutive in pluralist relationality. 
So if we start by thinking about the planet from the relationships that form it, rather than from the position of separate things that first exist independently and then come together to exert power over one another, then we might have a chance to develop radically new approaches to cooperation on climate change. Now I want to throw into the mix that pluralist relationality resonates in art and philosophy across a range of cultures and, and Lola has already raised this possibility with us. And at its most fundamental, pluralist relationality means starting our analyses by looking at relationships, but refusing to imagine relations as part of one all-encompassing whole. An illustrative example uh, that we recognize from Lola Frost's art can be seen in the Taoist yin yang symbol. So here a light half and a dark half together form a circle. Originally expressed through the metaphor of light and shadow moving over a mountain, uh, the darkness is only dark relative to the light. Thinking of the light as light only makes sense in relation to a corresponding concept of darkness. So light and dark aren't essential properties, they are mutually constitutive qualities. In addition, the light dot in the dark and the dark dot in the light emphasize that neither of these relationally constituted qualities is complete and unambiguous. The light always has an element of darkness in it. There is always light in the dark. Now, many cultures and vocabularies that are often thought of as Western and, and cultures elsewhere uh, also resonate with this focus on mutual constitution, like social network approaches, deconstruction, and variants of feminism, for example. None of these image, uh, images and imaginaries are innocent. The art that we've seen is not neutral, uh, and it's not supposed to be. None of these imageries or languages. Uh, provide a guaranteed anti-colonial or non-colonial approach. No language and no art can do that, I would suggest. Indeed, like other languages, they can be appropriated for totalitarian purposes, and they are. Nonetheless, I do think that they can help shake up our approaches to the urgent problems of planetary politics when we feel like we are stuck with them. We do need a profound rethinking of the way that we approach planetary politics. And I think that art as research and as diplomacy can help us overcome some of the binary and unit-based thinking that set us up to fail. And with that opening gambit, I will look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Astrid. A very uh, powerful ending to your presentation to provoke thought during the discussion. Uh, I will now ask Lola and Angela to join us on the screen. Um, picking up, sorry, I'll just get Lola, there we go. So picking up Astrid there and what you've said around, you know, binary constructs and assumptions around, you know, state to state relations and, and how diplomacy plays out or international co cooperation plays out. We, people usually think of diplomacy happening um, in those ways that you've described around you know, govern, government officials speaking to one another or international agreements being reached and COP26 was very much approached uh, in that traditional way, as you mentioned. So thinking about art as a communication medium in contrast to these other you know, traditional spoken or written forms, uh, what does that offer us, you know, in contrast to those methods, uh, what does art give us or what could art achieve that those others don't? Mm -hmm. I might uh, start with Lola on this one and we'll go around the room. Big question. Well, um, art, of course, is already quite fragmented um, in our societies. And I suppose I would say for a start, let's start taking art very seriously, because I think, like Astrid says, it has enormous ethical resources for us, uh, which we, well, I mean, there are lots of things that have destroyed that 
belief in the ethical um, power of art is not least the, the art market. I mean, the art market reduces art simply to exchangeable commodities. And um, I'm always so appalled when people only refer to my art in terms of its selling power or not. Uh, so there's this terror, this terror in society that art is actually only a commodity. And I think we should well, contest that. And I think we should have many more conversations like this where um, people, artists like Angela and myself speak about our art. Um, we, we, we are of course, are particular kinds of artists who are researchers as well. But I, I really liked Angela's project of, in a sense, a, a, herself, being a, a diplomat, collecting everybody's everybody's attitudes to very ordinary day uh, processes and problems in in our everyday life, and um, need a, I mean, what we also really need to do is funding for that because the the arts funding is 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 awful. Uh, so I th I think we need to do more of this. We need to ask people to think about how valuable art is in this project of building mutual recognition between one another. That's really what I was trying to say. It really is a fantastic space, which we always have used as a space for building mutual recognition. And it, it can continue more and can do much better. Thanks, Lola, that's fantastic. Angela, um, you know, Lola just spoke about your work and, and what's interesting, you know, you're, you're obviously a researcher as well as an artist, but you do describe yourself as a climate change communicator. And I think that almost sets the foundation for thinking of art as a communication medium rather than a commodity, like Lola has said. So I guess, how do you see art, you know, what, what can it contribute when we're talking about this as a communication method and in terms of building cooperation on international issues like climate change? Yeah, sure. I guess like on the subjects of um, communication, um, I find it very troubling to sit with the title or the label of a curator because that's inherently dependent on these connotations of the institutional curator, someone who gathers a lot of different kind of uh, works together, but is, um, yeah, I just, I just feel like when I'm working with climate change, the main thing that I want to focus on is getting the message out there in an accessible way, one that is also hopefully kind of fun as well, one that actually stays with people enough to um, influence some sort of personal or collective change. Um, whereas like the term curator, although that's um, probably the, the longest kind of like practice that I've had within the creative arts um, uh, in my career so far, um, I've just felt very kind of, yeah, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not totally sat well with me. Um, and this goes in line actually with exactly what Lola has picked up on, it, the funding of the arts. A lot of the funding in the in the arts within Europe um, that I've experienced is also very problematic. It has come down from either fossil fuel companies or there are a lot of um, kind of private funders, patrons who come from uh, you know very wealthy families who are trying to what we call greenwash or even arts wash uh, or genocide wash a lot of um, you know their own uh, issues. Um, and remove accountability um, on their parts to uh, a lot of crimes against humanity um, that they have uh, taken part in. And so what does it mean that you know, our public narrative, which we'll kind of talk a bit later about as well, um, is so dependent on you know, a very limited fund. Um, we need different ways to actually uh, value arts, not as a commodity as Lola so rightly puts, and so what's something that is for the common good, for the public good, because, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of arts and artists, activists are also artists. It's all very mixed up together and very fluid, I think. Um, and that the arts always creates a space um, that facilitates experimentation. And this experimentation allows for a lot of social good and, um, and strategies to 
be tried out, to be tested out, and new ways of rethinking economies, rethinking kind of the ways that we want to live and support and love each other. You know, these are things that um, we don't get in in kind of um, a, a market, whether that's the art market or you know, in, in an institutional uh, setting of academia that might have limitations because of also, you know, funding structures or, um, yeah, different conflicts of interest. Um, so the arts provides a great space for experimentation in that sense. Thanks, Angela. Um, before we move away from, from this first question, Astrid, I'd like you to expand on some of what you were saying in your presentation and We've had a question come in from Alici, which I think, um, you know, kind of goes to the heart of what I want to get out of this first question, which is how can pluralist relation relationality be concretely used in building constructive international cooperation to fight climate change? So I guess, you, you know, you said there's another way to approach this. How does that play out practically? Mm. So I don't have all the answers, I'm, I'm afraid, uh, but I think we genuinely need a rethinking on a kind of more profound level. Like, yeah, of course, we could take some of Lola's wonderful art pieces and give it to a diplomat to give us a present to another diplomat. And it would be part of, of traditional um, kind of international relations and di diplomatic practice. Um, and in that sense, Art, of course, can be part, uh, as I suggested, of business as usual. But I think art also has the potential to evoke something more that's really difficult to do through policy documents, for example. And that is partly a way of questioning and challenging and moving us away from this international that is the foundation for exercises like COP that is all based on the idea that we operate as fundamental uh, state units in from from the the perspective of national interest and we've seen how far that has gotten us in terms of mitigating climate change not far enough and not quickly enough right so I think that there's a real challenge here to us and it's a really urgent challenge that we need to profoundly rethink the way we engage with one another in the world and simply doing that through the same old interstate system isn't really working out for us it's not working out for the planet and I think well maybe I've overdrawn the kind of the distinction between um, traditional politics uh, state-based diplomacy if you will and art uh, because, of course, I could imagine a uh, policy document that manages to evoke the sublime and challenge our emotions. I've never seen that policy document, to be fair. Uh, but I could imagine that it could exist, perhaps by learning something from uh, these artistic practices. Of course, it's not impossible for Boris Johnson to curate and archive conversations beyond the same old right he could learn something from Angela in terms of what uh, people what discussions and what vocabularies are part of a public discussion right it's not impossible to do but the incentives just aren't there and I think art has something to offer in terms of uh, putting those discussions into conversation and what it can do um, more than that, and where I think there's a real challenge here that I was kind of trying to get at by evoking a kind of Taoist and feminist and, and deconstructionist ethics, uh, is art has an ability, visual art has an ability, um, that is very tricky to get at through spoken or written words of going beyond binaries, right? So words, by definition, can only mean something if they don't mean other things. Otherwise, all we have is like one massive word that means everything and means nothing, right? So words, um, by their very nature, have a binary distinction between meaning, what they mean and what they don't mean, 
right? Otherwise, they are not part of a communicative language. There can be no such thing as a private language, right? Art, I think, can shake up that binary thinking. It can offer an inroads into something different, that kind of our discussions about philosophy through things like Taoism, feminism, and so on, tries to get at, but that visual art can embody, can evoke, can emotionally reach us with in a way that I've yet to come across any philosophical treaties, uh, policy speech, uh, or a COP document uh, that managed to, to do. So I think there's a, a really big potential there for art to help us in that profound rethinking uh, of how we relate to the world that, that we need. Yeah, absolutely. You know, wording is so restrictive and, and art can be interpreted in so many ways. So I think broadening the language and, and conversation, um, art is, you know, the mechanism by which you can do that. Um, and that relates to something that Angela touched on around public narrative and how that's framed, um, you know, and again, going back to what you said, Astrid, around state to state, um, you know, that sort of binary construction of, of who is shaping this narrative or dialogue. Angela, I wanted to pick that up with you and ask about how uh, art creates the space for others to shape the discussion around environmental issues. Sure. Well, I'll first thing I want to like recognize that um, throughout my practice that I have, you know, realized and I've been up against the parallels within um, both the arts as well as the environmental and climate discourses and uh, the movements there are similar barriers uh, for racialized people, for queer people, for working class people, you know, and differently able bodied or disabled people. These are the same systemic barriers that, you know, flow into whatever kind of, uh, you know, global crisis we're talking about. And the arts is something that is, you know, inherently elitist, you know, it's, it's something that a lot of regular, you know, citizens or just members of the public uh, feel like they need to know a lot before they can step into an art gallery the same way that a lot of people feel like they don't have the specific expertise or the vocabulary to talk about climate or environmental issues and so they don't know where to start or they are not interested in beginning these conversations so actually for me to work on in the overlap the intersection of both arts and climate change I'm stuck with this kind of double uh double of uh, kind of uh difficulty which actually is when you recognize it as the same systemic structure that um, is causing these barriers actually simplifies it in in many ways it's a you know it's a template that's been replicated um and so what i work by is to really forefront that we need to deconstruct the criteria um of needing expertise for this tick of what is required for us to feel like we qualify to you know experience arts or to um, let others experience what we have lived as climate and environmental changes in our daily lives or you know um, daily lives of people that we our family and our friends from you know elsewhere in the world um, so this kind of breaking down of I guess what we um, value as knowledge that matters value what kind of experiences are worth listening to and worth even recording this is where the self-archiving comes into into my practice in a really important way it's like saying that no not only are you worth you know taking up space and listening to because you know you are also experiencing certain things that the hegemonic kind of like global north narrative um, is taking the most space of um, you're also worth the, the ink and the paper, the digital space, the cloud space to record what is happening in your life at this very moment. So that people in you know, 2040, 2050, when the UK starts to experience the most severe water crises um, uh, impacts can, can actually look back to this time and say, well, these specific people in these regions of the UK were already organizing we're already conserving water because actually we know that, you know, where we come from in other parts of the world, water is already scarce. 
Um, so things like that is is making it, you know, more dynamic in terms of what we accept as, um, you know, uh, things that we want to learn from. And once we kind of get over that, you know, barrier for the mainstream, um, we can start accepting a lot of different perspectives and see them as, you know, equally as important. Thanks, Angela. Lola, does any of that resonate with you? Yes, a lot. Um, I, I, I just want to, I think about all of those things a lot, um, but I, I want to make a distinction, which I mentioned in my paper, but which I think is actually a really important distinction. Um, there's a difference between art practice and art activism. And uh, I think what Angela has been talking about is art activism. And um, I think art activism has indeed the wonderful capacity to approach ordinary people's lives and to deal with their terrors about the expert and about, and encourage them to develop languages and ethics around these issues. Uh, and, and I think we need a lot of art activism. And I suppose in the same breath, I would say we also need a lot of art education. Because I, I speak from the perspective of being an artist who, and I'm not an art act activist. I mean, I, I'm passionately of the uh, conviction that the artwork has to do everything uh, and that it takes an enormous amount of skill to get the artwork to do everything. Um, I mean, it's taken my life, it's my life's dedication to get the artwork to do what it does. Um, and it's not just something you, you know, you do. Uh, it's something you really focus on. It's something you really understand, something you get other people to, to vet. You want to hear what everybody else has got to say, this, that, you know, and then and the, the knots I've got myself tied up into about what other people say in inter interrogating my own practice. In fact, writing this paper was another interrogation of my practice. I thought, gosh, yes, finally I've nailed the ethical one. Um, because... Um, I think that, but I, what I'm saying is that irrespective of, and I, this is what I claim all the time, and, and that's a question we might want to talk about. I claim that irrespective of what I say, the artwork has to do it. And that what we need is as many artworks as we, are, as we can get, getting out there doing it. But the other side of it, of course, and I, and I experience this a lot, uh, really in relation to something Angela has just said as well, People don't, don't believe that their responses to the, they don't believe they can read the artwork. Uh, and if a, an artwork can't be read, then it's no good as an artwork. So uh, we really do also need, there is this very specific quality to arts, works of art. We also really need artworks that speak. We need to insist on um, making them and on sharing them and on communicating with each other around what has happened. And what has happened is also always very unique. I mean, what happens, I, I love being in my exhibitions, especially with nobody who knows anything. And then they come along and they say, oh, is that it? And I say, yeah, fantastic. And, and, it's, and, we, and the best, best conversations I have with people are with people who don't know, who don't come with prearranged expertise although of course I love it when the expertise lot come along as well I'm very very interested in what they have to say so I guess what I'm saying there's a huge epistemic politics around the framing of art and of course around the framing of art activism and I think we need to really embrace that epistemic politics I have to do it as an artist I have to really understand what it is that I'm doing, whom, I, whom I'm offending, whom I'm lo uh, who's loving it and why, and, and, and engage in the conversations with them so that everybody can get on, get into this pluralizing relationality that Astrid says that art can do, and I believe it can. Uh, yeah, I leave it there. That was fantastic. I just wanted to second that point, actually. Sorry. Yeah, go for it. it agree with Lola that yeah our education is definitely something that we need to um, place a lot more importance in especially in this country where this government completely does not value it at all um, I'm also visiting lecturer at an art school in London and I just feel that it's something that is is gives gives people so much more criticality to society it's something that we definitely need to uh, make sure we we uh, 
yeah, uh, sustain and also um, continue, yeah, continue with, with a lot of um, urgency. Um, I would say, though, that I wouldn't dif differentiate between art practice and art activism because I value, um, you know, direct action um, visual cultures um, within a gallery space as much as an academically, uh, I guess, like a uh, practiced artist. Um, I, I feel like this kind of, um, yeah, I think I think the hierarchy between like um, a, an art school artist and an activist artist uh, isn't some, something that's necessarily helpful especially when we're talking about political issues like climate change or race. Definitely. Thanks, Angela. We don't have a lot of time left, but I wanted to bring it back to, you know, some of with what we've touched on around, um, you know, cultural exchange. And Angela, you questioned whether we are in peacetime. We know, and you know, that colonial narratives still dominate discourse, not just about the environment, but most issues. Um, and there is, you know, still such a divide between the global north and global south, but also at the moment, it's a highly fractious political environment in relation to um, China and, you know, the UK and Europe and other Western democracies dealing with China. So how can art help us bridge that gap that currently exists through those you know, the political channels or these more official channels. Astrid, can I start with you? Um, well, I think echoing, but also pushing a little bit at, at uh, what Lola and Angela have been saying about art's potential to kind of communicate and, and uh, especially Lola's desire to not be an activist. I'm really sorry, Lola, but I think you are. I think <laughs> I think I your agree. art is activist in the most wonderful of ways, and um, I think at the end of the day, uh, what's true for art is the same as what's true for you know a political book that I might write. That you know I work really hard to make sure that. I communicate what I intend, but what goes out there and what somebody hears from what I say always escapes my intention, right? Uh, I cannot own uh, in a, any kind of complete way uh, what meaning, what message um, others take from what I say, apologies. Um, so I think that there is, there is always imperfect communication, regardless of culture, regardless of language, regardless of medium. Uh, my communication um, can only reach so far and its intention always escapes me. And that's part of what's really wonderful about communication, because what somebody might hear from what I say might be something much more clever than what I intended in the first place. And it might be something better and more promising. And that's what I hope <laughs> with my philosophy with my politics and what really good art can also do is to evoke something even better in others and and that's my hope for communication in all these forms thanks astrid that was a nice positive note um, to end on and i want to give andrew and lola a chance to to make a final comment either on that topic about you know bridging cultural divides or just in general about you know what you hope people take away from this session today going forward um lola shall i start with you well i i mean in developing my presentation i really took that insight on board and i approached yafeng duan in berlin precisely because she was chinese and um i i was d delighted to communicate with her and i've also of course shown the work of Simon Sefton from South Africa. So in that sense, I was already trying to build an audience, uh, practitioners and an audience around this conversation. And I was trying to draw them together under this topic of the life force of life force ethics of art. So I, I just think we should do that more. We should collaborate as artists and we should collaborate as audiences um, because I, um, I think that's the impasse that we it's we can address the impasse that the state centric um, what's it uh, this we held hostage as Astrid says 
to the state-centric view. I think as citizens uh, and increasingly global citizens now, we really have to talk to each other about art and climate change. Angela? Yeah, to, to add to that, in terms of talking to each other about climate change, um, I was lucky enough to spend um, autumn, winter um, of 2019 on a research grant, um, researching visual cultures on climate change um, in Sinophone, East Asia, so Taipei, Hong Kong, and mainland China as well, meeting with science fiction writers, activists and artists who are dealing with climate issues. And I think there's just so much grassroots level um, creativity happening, whether that's in activism or arts or community level kind of like um, farming. There's so much going on that I think that we don't necessarily need to just fixate on what is getting the most funding from state level or kind of institutional level um, grants. Uh, there's a lot that's on the ground that, you know, with a bit of um, web searching, we, we have so much access to and so much access to their knowledges that we can start communicating and having conversations and building bridges. I also want to finish on the fact that, you know, for me as a Hong Kong diaspora in the UK, I, I also, you know, I'm so happy when I meet other Chinese, British born Chinese people in the UK diaspora who are also, you know, practicing artists and, and thinkers. And it just kind of, you know, is, is a really great space um, to, you know, have community level conversations with each other. Um, so there's a lot going on and I encourage people to get involved and have these conversations as both Astrid and Lola encouraged to. So thank you. Absolutely, thank you, Angela. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time and I think we could definitely talk about this for, for hours and hours and, and not get bored. It was so fascinating and, and each of you brought something really you know, new and different to the conversation. So thank you all so much for sharing your time and your thoughts and your artwork and your perspectives. Um, it's really important, as you all said, to have this conversation, um, but you know, it takes effort and energy to do that. So thank you. And thank you to those who joined us to listen in to the conversation. Um, it's great to have had you, to have hosted you, and we look forward on behalf of the Lao China Institute, we look forward to hosting you again soon. Have a lovely evening. Thanks, everybody. Bye.